I think so. uh, uh, yes, we are live. Sure. All right. Hi, everyone who has joined us. Uh, my name is Nico Adams. I'm Alexander Criswell. And I am Lauren Lofman. Alexander, do you want to take it for the intro? Oh, sure. Um, so hello. Yes. Uh, tonight in Universe at Home, we are going to be doing a couple of fun things. I am going to be giving a talk that will cover all of time in just 20 minutes. And Nico is going to be showing off that uh, wonderful piece of equipment right behind him, which maybe you can talk a little bit more about. So really quick, I'm going to stop your video, Alexander, so we can okay. take a look at this, uh, this telescope behind us that we are going to take a look at. Absolutely. I believe I can put a spotlight on myself. I believe that's how that works. All right. Uh, can you guys see me? <laughs> Am I coming through? Yeah. Uh, on the Zoom All right. Call, <laughs> yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So you can see I'm here in the University of Minnesota's Astronomy Dome. I'm masked up. And this is our, uh, excuse me, this mask isn't perfectly fitting. So <laughs> we'll have to be adjusting it a little bit. But oh, uh, we are currently live streaming from uh, the Astronomy Dome uh, of the Historical Tate Telescope. And I'll go into a lot more detail about what that is and what it means. But uh, the idea is we want to give a tour of this to you guys uh, virtually in whatever uh, capacity we can during uh, the time of the year when we typically would be gathering more during, especially during semesters, we give weekly tours of this. So if ever uh, we can gather again, I would highly recommend coming to see it in person. But I will do my best to give you a tour of uh, what this telescope is and why it's so important. It's, it's sort of the uh, centerpiece of, of the astronomy outreach program at the University of Minnesota. And with that, I will turn it back to Alexander. All right. Uh, are we good to go on the screen sharing? Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's all right. cool. uh, very technical difficulties. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Universe at Home. Tonight, I'm going to be taking you on a journey through all of time in just 20 minutes. There is a lot to get through, so let's get started. If we're going to talk about all of time, it may be worth asking, what came before? And the answer is that we actually don't know. It could be a bouncing universe, it could be quantum fluctuations, it could be absolutely nothing at all. In our best understanding of the universe, which is called Big Bang Cosmology, time itself didn't necessarily exist out of this thing called the singularity. So before, in quotes, might not actually mean anything at all. Let's stick with that, which means that we need to talk about the singularity. The universe, everything we've ever known, and far, far more than we ever will know, packed into a single point of infinite density and temperature, so unbelievably dense and compact that every single law of physics we rely on breaks down. Everything from Einstein's general relativity to our understanding of matter called the standard model no longer functions in this regime. Start the clock. Suddenly the universe begins to expand. All forces are unified. Gravity, electromagnetism, and the weak and strong nuclear forces are tied together in ways we have yet to understand. The entire universe is still 100 million trillion times smaller than a single proton. At 10 to the negative 43rd seconds, we enter the grand unification era. Gravity separates from the other forces. We don't know why or how. At 10 to the negative 37 seconds, inflation begins. Something in the structure of the universe shifts. The phase transition, analogous to freezing or condensation, and the entire universe suddenly expands far faster than the speed of light, increasing in size by a factor of 10 to the 78th. Now, I tried to come up with tangible reference points for this number, and frankly, there aren't any. It is much, much larger than even the difference in scale between a single atom and our entire observable universe. This expansion takes about 10 to the negative 33 seconds. 
we haven't even come close to a single second of the universe. And looks like I'm already three, four minutes in. I guess I better hurry up. In these scant few moments of inflation, quantum fluctuations slightly change the distribution of energy in the universe. These new minuscule variations will grow to become the large scale structure of the universe, but we'll get to that later. At 10 to the negative 30 second seconds, inflation has stopped entirely. The formless energy of the early universe begins to condense into the elementary particles we know and love, creating equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Something, and yet again, we're not sure what, but it was definitely something, occurs to shift this perfect balance between matter and antimatter in favor of matter. As the majority of this matter-antimatter stew annihilates back to energy, a few bits of matter remain, about one particle in every 30 million. You'll recall from your personal experience that things tend to be made of matter. This is why. We're going to pick up the pace now, 10 to the negative 11 seconds. The average energy of a particle in the universe enters the upper end of what we can achieve in our most powerful particle accelerators. At 10 to the negative six seconds, a millionth of a second, the first protons and neutrons form. We finally reached one solitary second into the entire history of the universe. This is where the first electrons form, where the majority of matter in the universe is no longer relativistic, where the universe begins to be dominated by photons, light. However, it is still opaque. Each individual photon can hardly move without being absorbed and re-emitted by the particles surrounding it. None of these photons will ever be seen by human or alien eyes. After a few minutes, I told you we'd pick up the pace here, the universe has cooled enough the first deuterium and helium nuclei form. This has a fancy name even, it's called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. A few years later, 379,000 to be precise, everything once again changes. Electrons begin to combine with hydrogen, deuterium, and helium nuclei to form the first atoms and the universe is filled with brilliant light that at long last is free to travel as far as it wishes. This first light is the oldest thing we as a species have ever seen. You may have heard of it, it's called the cosmic microwave background. Then for about a billion years, not much happened. Not that we can see anyway. Remember those quantum fluctuations I mentioned earlier? This is where they come into play. Those tiny differences in density function as seeds. Dark matter forms into filaments and clumps as it is gravitationally attracted to slightly overdense regions of the universe. The hydrogen and helium gas left over from the early universe follows, creating vast voids and dense clusters. It is in these clusters that the first stars form. Clumps of hydrogen gas that grow hot and dense enough to ignite and begin nuclear fusion. They are huge, 100 to 300 times the mass of our sun and short-lived, burning for a scant few million years before violently exploding in supernovae. Coming up on a billion years, the first galaxies have formed, those filaments of hydrogen and dark matter becoming strands and clusters of galaxies, whose vast, those vast voids remaining empty and dark. After this, the universe looks much the same as it does today. It continues to expand, albeit much more slowly than during inflation. Stars and galaxies continue to form and fade away. We now turn our attention to a particular clump of loose hydrogen and helium enriched by the new elements created in the hearts of stars long gone. Five billion years into our history, the Milky Way forms. We wouldn't find it terribly interesting after all, it's just another fairly common spiral galaxy, except for the fact that we happen to live in it. Speaking of, fast forward another 4.2 billion years as stars flare to life and explode over and over and over again until one small yellow star forms in one of the arms of the Milky Way a molecular cloud collapsing down into a bright center surrounded by a hot disk of gas and dust. Most of this gas forms our sun, some of it being diverted into the gas giants that inhabit our outer solar system. 
The dust gradually clumps together, and about 9.3 billion years after the dawn of the universe, one of those clumps is somewhat recognizable, a rocky planet, the third one from its sun. Around this time, another planetoid smashes into the young Earth, throwing large amounts of molten rock into orbit. Some of it falls to back down to Earth, and the rest forms a moon. As a brief aside from our planet, at around 9.8 billion years, dark energy begins to dominate, and the universe's expansion starts to accelerate. At 10.3 billion years in, we see the first signs of simple life on Earth. Multicellular life arises around 12.3 billion years in, and the human species sees its first set of stars at around 13.7 billion years. Welcome to the modern day. You are here. We've come a very, very long way, but there is still so very far to go into the future. It's not necessarily pretty, but it's also very, very far off. From now on, we're going to count time from the present day. 200, or, sorry, 100 million years from now, Saturn's rings are slowly raining down onto the planet and in a relatively short time, they'll be gone. We're actually very lucky to live at a time when Saturn looks so gorgeous because in a few, just a short period of 100 million years, they'll be gone entirely. 600 million years from now, we will see the last solar eclipse. The moon is moving away from us at a rate of about 3.8 centimeters, an inch and a half or so, every year. Eventually, the size of the moon in the sky will no longer match that of the sun, and the last total solar eclipse will occur. As the sun evolves and burns through its fuel supply, it is slowly growing hotter and brighter. In 600 million years, plant life as we know it will be unable to survive on Earth, and in 800 million years, no complex life will be able to survive on the surface of our planet as it becomes closer in nature to modern day Venus than anything we see today. Humanity, if we're still around, will have to find a new home. At this very moment, right now, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are hurtling towards each other, drawn in inexorably by their mutual gravitational attraction. In four billion years, they will collide, creating likely the greatest light show to be ever seen from Earth and unleashing a new burst of star formation. The sun will likely be flung into the outer reaches of the galaxy, but the solar system itself will remain intact. Two billion years after they collide, the pair will have fully merged into a single large elliptical galaxy of the sort common across the universe. The sun will continue to grow and expand, changing its energy source and ballooning into a red giant. It will swallow Mercury and Venus, burning them to ash as it expands across their orbits. The Earth itself may or may not survive. It could either be incinerated by the expanding red giant, or due to the mass loss of the sun as it advances into this late stage, it could be pushed far enough out in its orbit by the changing gravitational field to avoid that fate. As the sun's diffuse outer layers begin to envelop the earth, their drag on the moon may bring it close enough that it passes earth's Roche limit, the point at which an orbiting body is ripped apart by tidal forces and disintegrate into short-lived rings that quickly fall onto the Earth. Seven, ooh, I'm sorry. Um, eight billion years from now, the sun fades away into a white dwarf. Our sun never violently explodes, instead quietly shedding its outer layers and leaving its core behind, a white dwarf approximately the same size as Earth. Fast forward a while, 150 billion years from now, the accelerating expansion of the universe will render all galaxies outside the local Laniakea supercluster inaccessible without the ability to travel faster than light. Don't worry though, that does still leave about 100,000 galaxies in our neighborhood. 
eventually all the dwarf galaxies orbiting Andromeda and the Milky Way will join them in one single galaxy. In 800 billion years, over 50 times the current age of the universe, red dwarfs, the longest lived stars, begin to fade away, having spent all their available energy. Two trillion years from now, because of the dark energy driven expansion of the universe, any light from galaxies beyond the local supercluster becomes so dim that even the most energetic events are completely invisible to our eyes or any telescope that we possess. In 100 trillion years, the last stars form. We now begin a slow fade into darkness. Cheery, right? After 1,000 trillion years, the final planetary orbits around stellar remnants are either disrupted by passing objects and thrown free, or at long last spiral into what was once their sun, now a neutron star or black hole. In 100,000 times that span, 10 to the 20th years, all stellar remnants meet a similar fate, falling into supermassive black holes or being ejected from their host galaxies to wander the void. In 10 to the 100th years, the last supermassive black hole will evaporate due to Hawking radiation. And now we reach the end, the big freeze. If the universe continues to expand, eventually all matter contained within it will become so spread out that it ceases to interact. All the energy spreads so thin that the universe temperature approaches absolute zero. Or, as another theory called the Big Rip postulates, if the expansion of the universe continues to accelerate, even the binding energy of elementary particles won't be able to overcome the expansion of the space that they occupy, and all matter will be ripped asunder. Eventually, space-time itself is ripped apart as the universe ends. Or you could have a big crunch or a big bounce, sensing a theme. If the universe's expansion slows to a halt, it could actually recollapse upon itself, returning to a singularity, and for the big bounce theory, possibly even another big bang, starting everything over once again. Or it could be the big something that we just haven't thought of yet. The far future is as of yet unknown and a topic of study for many theoretical cosmologists. Someone here that's listening right now could be the one to finally figure it out. In any case, this really is the end, not only of the universe, but of the talk. Any questions? Excellent job, Alexander. Hey everyone, we're now open to questions and I will uh, pass those on to Alexander and answer some. And then after that, uh, we will move on to the telescope stuff. So the first question someone has from John Strobel is, do we know how far the Milky Way is today from the expected location of the singularity? Ooh, that's, that is a very interesting question. Um, because it is, it is difficult to answer. The, the singularity does not have a location in our universe, if that makes any sense, because the singularity is where everything in our universe was at one point. So in a way, I could say that the Milky Way is right on top of part of where the singularity was, but then again, everything is. So the next question is, how are the exact times of all these events from the beginning and throughout all of this, how are they known? Uh, some of them are known very well. Others are wild estimates. Uh, if I was being very precise, I think I would have put a little squiggle before almost every single uh, date that I put in here. Um, the ones that we can calculate pretty precisely 
are things like uh, you know the timeline of life on Earth. We have good energy. We have good estimates for that. Um, things like the timing of the cosmic microwave background, we understand pretty well. Uh, our theory as to when events in the very early universe happened are decently precise. Uh, overall, I would say that most of the dates that I give in here are accurate to the level that I give them. If I say, you know, 9.2 billion years, it's somewhere around there, but it could be 9.23 billion years. It could be 9.19 billion years. If you've ever uh, had the misfortune to sit through a lecture on significant figures, that is the sort of thing <laughs> that uh, I was putting to use here. Um, so to sum up, fairly precise and we, we arrive at these conclusions, uh, these fairly precise but not perfectly accurate conclusions through a mix of, uh, in, in the past, you know, from uh, all of the, the time past the, uh, the formation of the cosmic microwave background, we can get to these dates through observation. Uh, everything else we arrive at through theory and through exp extrapolation from, from those observations, either backwards or forwards, depending on the case. It's, uh, it's a mix. I can definitely say that when we were in uh, our cosmology class last semester together, um, a lot of it boils down to a lot of equations and stuff in the end. Oh, so many equations. <laughs> Yeah, this, I think somebody, somebody asked a similar question, which maybe we'll get to, uh, about just how we know these quantities. Uh, is that the one that we were answering, or is that a different one? It's a, I don't know if it's the same one, but it's, it's similar at least. I think I, I, I saw that and I panicked just a little bit, because I think <laughs> you had like a 50 slide talk and almost every single slide, there was a different answer to that question, because this is such a huge <laughs> breadth of material and a huge different number of ways that we study it. Uh, some of the slides at the beginning had like six different answers to which like the epic inflation where the mm -hmm. universe was expanding really quickly. It's very difficult to explain how we figured out so precisely uh, that that's happening because we figured it out very precisely. We're very confident that, ha that it happened, but there are so many signals telling us that it's hard to pick just one to talk about. So I, I think one that I actually, I'll pick one out of the 50 that I can answer uh, because it's near and dear to my heart. And that's the ones talking about uh, when stellar remnants or planets will spiral into supermassive black holes or the, uh, the stellar remnant that they orbit around respectively. And that is because of, if you'll remember, there were, there were two statements made, I will actually fly all the way back uh, to this, we're talking about say planetary orbits specifically. Um, there are two things at play here. One of them is I, I said that either the orbit would decay and fall into its central body, or it would be thrown out of orbit and sent off to sail through the void. Um, and the reason that we can make those two statements, uh, the first one is due to a combination of um, drag from stellar wind and gravitational radiation, which is my favorite topic. Uh, as two bodies orbit each other, they are continuously emitting gravitational waves and that takes energy out of the system. So over very, very long time periods, like the sort that we're talking about here, kind of the 15th years, uh, with a you know, something like a planet and its star, that is enough time to actually radiate all of the energy in the system away to the point that it is nice and close and gets ripped apart by tidal forces. And, uh, on the other hand, the statement about, you know, if they haven't been pulled in, they'll have been flung out uh, is just statistics. If you have enough of these masses flying around, statistically, eventually, one of them will fly through your planetary system and there is a certain chance that that gravitational interaction will fling the planet out of the system. Um, and again, given enough time, you can say, well, at this point, any system where that would have been possible, you know, only 0.0000001% of these could possibly still be in their orbit. 
just because we've had so many interactions with other bodies that at that point, the chances of it not having been flung out are very, very small. I like this next question. Um, which one of the endings of the universe is the quote, good ending or the secret ending? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I think from a cosmic perspective, at least in my opinion, the big bounce would be the good ending because it uh, gives the potential for for a new universe and not just a, a slow drift into nothingness. Uh, unfortunately, I also have to share the bad news that that's probably not the one that we think is going to happen. Um, <laughs> uh yeah, any thoughts from you two? I mean, I don't really want our universe to get torn apart or like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not really about that. But that's just my opinion. On that note, I think we'll go to the next question <laughs> though, to not have an existential crisis. Um, this next one asks, what is causing the sun to expand into a red giant? Ooh. Let's hope my stellar professor from undergrad isn't here because I'm about to uh, hopefully get <laughs> this right. Um, so as the sun produces energy and it you know, is sent out into the solar system and dapples our faces and makes for lovely summer days, uh, it is doing that through nuclear fusion. It is taking and fusing hydrogen um, and moving up some various complicated processes. Uh, but the point is eventually it will run out of hydrogen in its core, at which point it will switch over to burning, um, to burning hydrogen in its outer layers, uh, which causes the sun to balloon up. And that is the transition that causes it to become a red giant. Uh, do either of you remember any more about this? Because I think we've reached the extent of what I have off the top of my head. Um, my stellar evolution class was three years ago. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's about as good a summary as I could give. Uh, next up, uh, what causes a big bang? Great question. Who knows? <laughs> uh, we're, we're working on that one. Not me personally, but physicists in general. Uh, yeah, we don't know. All right. Is there any debate over how the moon was formed? Or do all scientists agree on that? Oh, well, there's always debate. But, I mean, there's uh, a solid main theory. Yeah. I, this idea of a planetoid crashing into the early Earth and throwing material up into orbit is widely accepted, but you know, it's... It's science consensus uh, in the terms of everyone agreeing on a particular theory is often difficult to reach. Um, but with this, the majority of folks in the field uh, have come to the point of agreeing on the, uh, the planet's weight impact theory. I can add to that, that like with scientists measuring like the materials the moon is made of, mm -hmm. and given that it's made of a lot of, sim like it has like, similar minerals and rocks and stuff that are found in the earth's crust and all that jazz um that helps them become more confident that like this the moon had like a pretty big chunk of earth in it like olivine for example i'm pretty sure they've detected on the moon too and the moon is made up almost entirely of igneous rocks of the kind that you would find uh, around volcanically active regions on earth uh, which is good evidence that it at one point was a big molten blob of something uh, that was orbiting the Earth, and this is the best way to create a big molten blob of something. Next question is similar, I think, to what we addressed before, is how do people know what happened before humans even, even existed? And, you know, with all that and the question after that, like, the light just all happened in an instant at the beginning, you you went through the timeline and how we know that. Yeah, um, that, that does get to be a philosophical question uh, to which I, I think the, the answer is really deduction. You know, we see the, the stuff that we see out in the universe and it's up to us to try to best explain it. Um, and obviously no one was here, but you know, for the earth, we have the fossil record and we can look back at that. Uh, and 
the really cool thing with astronomy actually is that because light takes time to travel, when we look out into space, we're actually looking back in time to when that light was emitted, uh, which means that we can see things all the way back to that, uh, that cosmic microwave background. Uh, 379 some thousand years into the universe, uh, which is the last or first, depending on how you're thinking about it, thing that we can actually see of it. How can the universe be infinite if it started expanding 13.7 billion years ago? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh... It's kind of hard to conceptualize. Yeah. I do, the, I do have a way that I like to think of this, which is just that uh, if the universe was infinite the whole time, it's expansion. That's the really weird part. The expansion of the universe really just means that things that were close together are later very far apart. Uh, but the whole time, there was an infinite amount of space for them to fill in this model where the universe is infinite. Uh, that's sort of how I like to think of it. And uh, the hard part is, is really the expansion, understanding what it means that the universe is expanding. It's not that one thing was here and another thing was here, and they both went in different directions. It's actually that uh, it's, it's more like everything is staying still, but the space between them is getting bigger. Uh, and that is much harder to get your, your head around. Uh, a really common metaphor for this is- Raisin bread. Is that what you're going to say? That's the one I was going to bring up. That's actually yeah. an even better one that I was going to bring up. <laughs> but uh, the one that I like to bring up is ants on a balloon. If you are an ant and you're on a balloon and you blow up the balloon, and your ant friend is standing next to you also on the balloon. As the balloon expands, the ants will get further apart, but neither of them will have to crawl anywhere. Neither of them will have to move. Uh, so both of them are like, hey, I'm standing still. You're going really far away. I don't know what you're doing. And neither of them is actually moving. It's just the space between them that's expanding. Uh, a similar thing happens in raisin bread, where as the bread expands, each raisin, it's not moving. But uh, each individual raisin is sort of, the, the bread in between them is expanding, if you will. <laughs> When you cook raisin bread, the raisins get farther apart. <laughs> um, we literally learned that in my intro physics class. There are some very good metaphors for expansion of the universe. No perfect metaphors, but some very good ones. Uh, the next question, um, is there anything mentioned about the possibility that the universe could reunite back to the starting point? Is that like the crunch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be this, uh, this big crunch theory. Um, Again, from what we can tell, uh, the expansion of the universe is accelerating due to this dark energy component. Uh, and while this uh, big crunch slash big bounce sort of theory was uh, popular for a while, it has actually fallen out of favor. Uh, and chances are that this probably isn't the, uh, the final state for us. If the moon would eventually be released, no tides, correct. That is correct, Eric822. <laughs> um, without the moon, we don't have tides, and it would kind of be pretty bad. We need those. <laughs> um, I actually learned something pretty interesting, uh, which if my mom's watching, hi, mom, we had a conversation about this a few weeks ago, uh, and I figured out the answer. So yeah, the moon's moving away, and you would think that, well, if the moon keeps moving away, then eventually we won't have tides anymore. Uh, but, and while that's true, it turns out that what is causing the moon to move away is the fact that it is expending energy uh, to cause the tides. And there is a, uh, there's a, a friction there between the water and the earth that is taking energy out of the moon's orbit and pushing it further out. Um, but as you take the moon further out, the tides get lower and lower. And eventually, uh, the moon would stop moving out because there's a certain point at which um, the uh, the energy loss of the tides gets smaller and smaller, and so the moon's motion outward gets smaller and smaller. Uh, but the biggest answer is that that takes longer than it takes for the sun to balloon into a red giant, at which point it becomes a moot a point. All right, uh, next question um, is, why are we funding this? Why does space matter if it's not, all these events aren't gonna happen for like ages from now? And Nico, I know you had a good answer for this one prepared. Sure, so I was thinking about this actually, cause it came up in the queue and uh, 
I think there are two answers to it. That I this is something that I think about a lot because it is something that uh, I think astronomers are a little nervous to be asked sometimes because it it is true. It is, is these are very far away objects. Uh, I personally study galaxies, which are not objects that, to the best of my knowledge, me or any of my direct ancestors for for generations will ever be able to visit. They're just too far away. Uh, but that doesn't affect my love of astronomy or my uh, reasoning for funding it. And that's for two reasons. The first is that I think astronomy is really unique as a science for how its job is just to inspire people. Uh, there are a lot of scientists, sciences that are, that are incredibly inspiring. The work that is being done with them uh, says a lot about the human condition and the universe in which we live. I think astronomy is unique in that it has said the most about it in a lot of ways. And it has said uh, that that is one of the fundamental reasons why we have it. Uh, so it, for example, we're doing this program because I, in my opinion, part of having an astronomy department is sort of letting people who are not necessarily studying astronomy appreciate the beauty of the universe. I think it's really important that way. Uh, so it's part of it is just that it is incredibly inspiring. And that is, I think, a valuable thing. Uh, the other is that there are very tangible benefits to studying astronomy. Uh, one really good example of that is that there was a debate about the age of the sun around the uh, early 1900s, when we did not have an explanation for how the Earth could be 4.5 billion years old, or much older than we, uh, we thought, than the sun could be, because we had a limit on how the sun burned fuel of it would run out of fuel in 20 million years. So we couldn't match those numbers up for a really long time. And what eventually explained that was that the sun was undergoing nuclear fusion, which is a process that we did not have any conception could happen. So this story actually led to us, basically, uh, astronomers by discovering this helped motivate the age, uh, the nuclear age. They helped us realize that it was possible for uh, stars and therefore maybe humans to generate energy by manipulating atoms themselves. So there is this very, very significant invention, which is nuclear power, that in my opinion is one of the most significant inventions of the 20th century. And that was actually motivated by astronomy and specifically st astronomy studying something that was very far away, the sun and very old, like millions of years old. So there are ties in, I think, with with day to day human life as well. I think that was really well put. <laughs> yeah, that was really well said. Thank you. <laughs> it is a tough question that I had to grapple with while studying astronomy because it is it can get very abstract and very hard to access. So I think it's important for every astronomer to have like their their reasons why they think it's an important field uh, in the front of their mind. Also, like space is just really cool. And like, do you ever just get curious and want to know things? <laughs> like, yeah, I think the reason I like your answer so much, Nico, is that it's it's much more thought out and reasoned than mine, which is I, as a person, <laughs> find inherent value in finding out cool things and exploring the universe, and that's why I think it's important. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I think it's, in, in terms of funding, you can sort of you can compare a lot of the even the biggest telescope projects and the biggest. Uh, the most expensive astronomy projects that we do to like a blockbuster movie. And I personally get much more out of the astronomy that we fund than I do out of the movies. So it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's not quite a fair comparison, but I do think that astronomy is worth funding just based on that comparison. That's pretty legit. On to the next question. Does dark matter also come from the singularity and was everything around the singularity a perfect vacuum? So I'll, I'll take the first part first and the second part second. Uh, yeah, dark matter was also in there. Um, it's along with everything else. Uh, although, what does in there mean, right? Because you can't exactly say that our normal everyday matter was quote unquote in the singularity because it wasn't in that form. Um, and I would have a better answer for you as to what form uh, dark matter was in when we had the singularity and how it became dark matter, but we don't know what dark matter is or how exactly it formed. Um, presumably at some point it condensed out of the formless energy out of the very early universe, same as uh, normal everyday matter it did, but we just don't know how. Um, the second part of the, the question, uh, again, touches on one of the very difficult conceptual parts of this in that there is no outside of the singularity. Um, 
just like at you know the present day, there's nothing outside of the universe. Even though it's expanding, it's not expanding into anything. Uh, like Nico said, the space between things is just getting larger. Um, the singularity, as near as we understand it, was everything. Uh, and there was no things, so to speak, or nothing outside of the singularity, because outside of the singularity doesn't have meaning any more than, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, before the singularity does either. That's a good answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Um, that's not really a question, more of a comment. Uh, I mean, I also don't want the... I don't want our planet to get destroyed when the universe ends, but you know. Um, the question, how is Earth created? Do you want to touch back on that again with the solar sure. system? Yeah, uh, let me go to that and also say that I believe Nico is probably gearing up to do his uh, tour. So this, I think, will probably be the last question for now. Um, and then uh, if we have time at the end, we can probably pick up a few more. Uh, so our understanding of the Earth's formation uh, has to do with the, the early solar system, where, as you can see on the screen here, there was this large disk of gas and dust. Um, and basically, some of the smaller bits of, uh, of material in there started to clump together. Um, and the more clumpy a certain region of that disk, uh, disk of in this case, dust is the part that we're worried about. Uh, the more clumpy that part gets, the more dust falls down onto it, just because it's now a larger mass and has more gravitational interaction. Uh, and that goes on for a while until the, uh, the planetoid and then eventually the planet has accreted all of the material in the space around it down onto it. Um, and that's kind of how uh, any rocky planet and the Earth uh, forms over time. All right, Nico, are you ready to show off the telescope? I am. Uh, give me one second to switch to my phone, actually. If you want to take one more question while I do that, uh, right. now would be a good time. All right. Uh, this, la this last question then is, if the models depend on constant laws of physics, does anything change if there's a variation in those constants, like if the speed of light was different? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Welcome to the field of theoretical cosmology. Uh, yeah, if, if you change the rules, the results change with it, um, which is actually why we're fairly confident in a lot of the, the rules that we have, because you can sit down with just a pencil and some paper or you know a supercomputer, uh, depending on how you're approaching it, and put those rules in and make predictions about the universe, uh, and then we go out and that is actually what we see. Um, so things like the constancy of the speed of light seem to be consistent. Uh, the laws of physics after the very early universe, uh, where they were in forms that we don't currently understand, do seem to have worked out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if something changed in a way that wouldn't let us know that it changed, we, we would never know. Um, but as far as we can tell, they, they do seem to be consistent. Nico, your audio, I think, is echoing. All right. Um, like, uh, is Nico ready, or should we take him to the question? Um, I, I am ready. Uh, All right. I will stop sharing. And uh, I mean, to you, really quick. All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Tate Hall Observatory. So a quick motivation for why I think this is a, this is a very cool tour that we get to do, albeit in virtual form. Uh, I, I like to view astronomy as a 4,000 year long relay race because it was one of the first precise sciences that humanity ever engaged in. And on top of that, it has had so many generations building off of the work of the last. Whereas many scientists are, uh, many sciences are much more short lived than that. So it is just so fascinating to me to learn about uh, how we got to where we are today in terms of our knowledge of the universe. So I want to give a quick tour of this telescope, which preserves one of the legs in that relay race. 
Now I'm on my phone, so it's gonna be a bit shaky because we don't have a professional camera person with us to help. But uh, I will do my best to give a fair tour of the telescope. And uh, really quick note, uh, Alexander or Lauren are able to see my video okay? Yes. Yeah, we can see you. Excellent, okay. So I'm gonna just give a quick lengthwise view because this room is unfortunately too small for any one camera to capture the entire telescope. This telescope is 12 feet long uh, and it has a, at one end, 10 and a half inches across uh, aperture, as we call it. So at one end, we have the objective lens, which is the 10 and a half inch uh, glass, glass lens. At the other end, we have the very tiny eyepiece, which is about that size. So it's good enough to look through, very, very, very small. Uh, so this telescope was actually constructed. Oh, no. Nico, your audio cut out. And the data is frozen. No longer used uh, for research because, oh, oh no. He's back and he's frozen. <laughs> Nico, just a warning. It seems your Wi-Fi signal in the dome is not great. Well, we are waiting for this. Uh, is there another question in the uh, in the chat that we can answer? I really like this one comment in the chat. Uh, so the moon is like one big battery. <laughs> in a way, yeah. <laughs> big old, <laughs> big old gravitationally based battery. I think we have Nico back. Hello, Nico. All right, Alexander or Lauren, am I coming through more clearly? Yes, uh, you are. Yeah. Uh, this is the limitation of giving a presentation in the Astronomy Dome uh, during a pandemic, everyone. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Uh, let me know if I cut out again, and I'll switch back to my computer. Uh, so this telescope was built in 1896, and that's sort of the leg in the relay race that it preserves. Uh, it's a really interesting time in astronomy because it was just before the age where electricity was really common. So this telescope... Uh, was built around then, it, it had, uh, you can see that it is basically just a long tube. And the reason that's true is that it was not a reflector telescope, which is how most telescopes are built today with mirrors. The reason is we just didn't have the technology to build precise mirrors that could uh, collect light as precisely as, as just plain lenses could back then. So what we ended up doing is this telescope cost about $10,000 of 1896 money. And That's it's a just a long tube because the only way to build a telescope that was more precise back then was to make it longer. Uh, it is not, as it was called in an article on this telescope, one of the monster telescopes in the country at the time, because there are telescopes three times this size that are built on the same technology, just a long tube with a lens at one end and a lens at the other. Instead, it's sort of a very small, precise telescope. So that's the context for why it was built. Uh, one of the reasons that it was built, and in fact, the main thing that was done with it scientifically is it was a form of precisely measuring where things were in the sky, which at the time was a very novel concept. Uh, it was very difficult for astronomers at the time to do any precise measuring because the only way for a very long time for an astronomer to measure something was to look into a telescope with their own eye and to just tell other astronomers where they thought something was in the sky. Uh, the reason that's true is that we did not have photographic technology either. So there got to be this really big problem as, as astronomy got more precise, but human beings did not. And uh, it was known as the personal equation where it's not a real equation, but it was the idea that any one person looking to a telescope could give a different answer than the other. So this is one of the first telescopes that was built uh, with photographic plate technology. You could attach a photographic plate at this end and it would help you uh, give a, an objective in it, image that you could analyze later. So you could just hold on to that and show it to other astronomers rather than having to look in one at a time. So I believe my phone is in the process. I am so sorry. I believe my phone is in the process of dying suddenly. Oof. All right, am I coming through from my, from my computer? Yes, but I yeah. would suggest that you pin your uh, your current video as we have a very nice highlighted uh, freeze frame of your. Oh phone no! <laughs> 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 this is an experimental tour on our part because uh, it is very difficult for us to. Uh, it's very difficult for us to give this tour with with these new technologies. We're still learning, and we're hopefully going to. Uh, fix some of these wrinkles as we, as we go into the rest of this year. 
so I'll continue to give my tour. I'll give it from my computer, so I won't be able to do that sort of back and forth along the telescope. So uh, one of the cool things about this telescope is that the lens, as I was, uh, as I was talking about, the objective lens at the very end is, as it is called, literally priceless. At the time it was built, this telescope and the observatory around it cost about $10,000. Now, we literally don't have the technology, the ability to reconstruct it because we just don't make lenses that way anymore. So there is a tiny warning at the bottom of the telescope that just says, do not clean the objective lens because if it were ever to smudge or uh, scratch, we would have no way of repairing or replacing it. We just don't have the technology to do so. Uh, what's cool about this telescope and what it did is it observed a lot of double stars with a precision that had never been uh, seen before in astronomy. So what I mean by that is that a double star is something that to the naked eye often looks like a single object. Uh, for example, Polaris, the North Star, is actually two stars that are so close together that without a telescope, you would not know that they are two different stars. Uh, this telescope is one of the ones that was invented to not just distinguish those stars and measure their properties, but measure exactly where they were relative to each other. And that was very important because we were still giving, uh, creating a map of the night sky and understanding, are these stars moving just a little bit relative to each other? For example, if you have a binary star, are those stars orbiting each other? Or are they moving throughout space relative to each other? Uh, they are so far away compared to objects that we might see in our own solar system, like the planets, that in order to measure that tiny motion, you would need to measure things. Uh, think of a protractor that measures 180 degrees, for example. Take one of those degrees and divide it by 60. And you have what is in astronomy known as an arc minute. And then divide that by 60. And you have in astronomy what's known as an arc second. So we've got a 60th of a 60th of a degree. And this telescope could measure to a third of that. And that was necessary in order to measure the tiny motions in these objects. So the kinds of publications that came out of this telescope were basically just lists of numbers, lists of where are these stars and where were these stars last time we checked and have we found any differences. Uh, unfortunately, I think the next part of my talk has to, be, <laughs> has to be scrapped a little bit because my phone is not working. So one of the things that is very cool about this dome is that not only is it the original dome, so you can see this sort of plaster material here. Uh, this is basically exactly the dome that was set up in 1896. There are, however, a lot of modifications. So this whole observatory room is a mix of the old and the new. Uh, for example, like I said, there was not really the ability to, uh, there wasn't really use of electricity at the time that this telescope was, was in its prime. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, however, is that as soon as I flip a switch over here, you'll start to hear a whirring sound. And you'll start to see a gearbox in here move, which I'm afraid you will not be able to see very closely. But if I get my laptop a bit closer, you can see some of them moving. So. I'm not sure, Alexander or Lauren, can you see any of the motion inside this box? No. Nope. Oh, particularly. That's unfortunate. <laughs> well, that is a very new addition. Uh, that was added between the 1930s and the 1950s. Oh, that's uh, new. The idea of that system. <laughs> hmm? 1930s, a new system. <laughs> it is a very new system on the scale of this of what this telescope was when it was uh, created. There was nothing like that at the time that the telescope was created. Your computer's yeah. reflecting. We still can't As, see it. <laughs> Huh? The computer screen is reflecting. We still couldn't see it. Oh, that's unfortunate. OK, well, the, the really interesting part about that system is it is designed to track the night sky precisely. And most modern telescopes have something like this, usually much better than what we have here, uh, which is that as the night, as the night sky uh, progresses through time, the Earth is rotating. And so the night sky rotates as we see it in the opposite direction. So in order to stay focused on any individual star where you zoomed in, you actually need to make the telescope move in the opposite direction. So when I flipped that switch, if I were to leave this room for 24 hours and come back, this telescope would have made a 360 degree rotation, pointed all the way that way, gone all the way back around and pointed back up again. Because whatever it's pointing at in the night sky would have made that exact same path. Uh, before the electronic system that we had to do that, the only way we had of doing it was we had a crank, we lifted up a giant weight, about uh, three or four feet off the ground, and then we just let it fall so slowly 
that it would pull the telescope very, very, very gradually in one direction, kind of like a grandfather clock does. Uh, another challenge involved in that is that one of uh, the, the only way that we have of looking out of this dome is through this tiny slit. Uh, so this, we have this circular roof that's kind of sphere-shaped, and then we have this rectangle that's cut out of it. The reason for that is that we want to keep this telescope as protected as possible from the elements and from the sky, but its whole job is to study the sky. So we do have to have some way for it to peer out of this shell that it's in. So we have this one very narrow strip where it can see the night sky. Uh, the problem is if you are not aligned with what you're trying to look at, if, it's not, if it doesn't happen to fall within that slit, uh, you're out of luck. So the solution to that Nico, we can't hear you again. Is that we can actually rotate the entire roof. So you'll see it rotating behind me as I press a button on this controller. I believe as it does that, you'll see the light around me changing. That is because the rectangular strip is rotating to a different spot in the night sky. So that is one of my favorite features of this room. It is just so fascinating to watch the entire roof move in service of this much smaller telescope encased inside. Uh, the idea is that if every 30 minutes or so, if you are tracking the sky, you will need to move the roof in order to keep the star that you're looking at uh, in view. So that was a very important system. And at the time that this observatory was built, that was not electronic either. That was actually just a rope that you would pull that would sort of spin the entire roof a little bit so that you could uh, get it aligned with what you needed to see. Uh, I personally have worked at another observatory with a similar telescope and it did still have the rope. And it was always just so fun to <laughs> sort of tug on that rope at the end of the night, get the entire roof spun back to where it was and just sort of clean up the telescope from, from the tours that we would give. So it is a really fascinating part of these, of these observatories. The challenges that they need to solve being encasings for these telescopes, but also windows to the night sky. So with that, we are pretty close to nine. Uh, I think I will cut off my tour there and I will just answer some questions if people have them about this telescope. Actually, I was also gonna mention, we should tell viewers how to see the comet that's in the sky and yes, um, that stuff. And we would have been doing a viewing tonight through the telescope. However, the camera that we are going to set up to look through the telescope is not working. So that is why we gave this telescope tour instead of how the big telescope works and all that jazz. So if there are no questions on the telescope, we can move on to how to see the comet. I wanna add one more thing actually, which is that uh, another part of the reason we did not do a live stream tonight, we did our best to make that happen, but. I highly recommend another channel for doing it, which, which frankly does it much better than we can with much more professional equipment. And that is interactive stargazing with Lowell Observatory, which Lauren, if you could put that in the chat, that would be a good help. So what's cool about that is they use a professional system to, to direct a telescope to uh, targets that users ask for. So if you happen to be online when the object that you wanna see is in the night sky, uh, they can actually point to it, take an exposure, and you can get, for example, a very accurate image of Saturn or Jupiter or the Andromeda galaxy uh, or all sorts of other objects that are just so fascinating. Uh, there's a question that says, how long did it take to make the telescope? I believe it was commissioned in 1895, so it took about a year. Uh, the challenge of making the telescope was, there. this was not mass produced necessarily. There were a lot of them made at the time through the company Warner and Swayze, which is uh, the company responsible for the mount that you see here. The real challenge was uh, when could you get the person who made these lenses to make us a lens? Uh, his name was John Brashear, and he was basically the lens master at the time. So whenever he was available, uh, he could sort of craft the lens using the new technology of optics that we had just sort of perfected. Uh, before he used that technique, the way that we made lenses was people would just sort of carve glass. They would sort of uh, rub it, polish it, do whatever they needed to do. And then they would shine a light through it and they would see if the lens did, did what it was supposed to do. And if it didn't, they would just have to sort of correct it to the best guess that they had. Uh, and what Brashear lenses did that was different is they, he actually started with a mathematical formula derived very recently and said, okay, the lens needs to look exactly like this in order to do what we want it to do. 
And the level of precision that was acquired by that technique was much higher. So uh, it took about as long as it, it took to get John Brashear to make us a lens, is, is the real limiting factor. All right. So shall we uh, quickly point out where in the sky one can look uh, for the comet Neowise if one wishes to get up extremely early in the morning? So for the evening sky, you'll want to be looking northwest. Um, specific, and then approximately like between 10 and 10.30 p.m. is the ideal time to see it as it'll be just above the horizon. So make sure you don't have any trees blocking your view or anything. Um, and yeah, so Northwest just above the horizon after the sun has set, um, and it should appear at this point in time as just like a smudge, but if you get out a camera or binoculars, you'll be able to see it more. The smudge is the tail of the comet that you'll be seeing. And then alternatively, you can wake up obnoxiously early in the morning, like four in the morning and try and... <laughs> I, I tried waking up at four, I could not do that. And you'll wanna be looking more in Northeast kind of direction. And again, it'll be just above the horizon as a smudge, um, but you get out your binoculars or, your, t or um, your camera and you'll actually be able to capture some beautiful photos of this comet. Um, am I missing anything? I don't think so. Uh... I will actually add to that. It should be visible. It, it should be visible it, with massive quotes. Uh, well into August, if all things goes, go well, but comets are famously unpredictable because it's very hard to know how their chemical composition will sort of interact with the sun's uh, radiation when it's so close. So it's possible that it would continue glowing this brightly uh, well into the middle of August. It is also possible that the comet will sort of exhaust its fuel supply and it will something will chemically change about it and it will no longer be as visible. Uh, so just so you're aware, this is the peak week. If you can see it uh, this week, that is the optimal time to try to get, uh, get a look at it. And if you can't see it, don't feel bad. It's not just you. Me and Nico went outside last night to try and see it. And I think there might've just been like a tree or something in the way because we didn't see anything. <laughs> I don't. It, I don't think it was a tree, based on photos that we've looked at since then. It was. It was uh, a mix of light pollution from Minneapolis, I think, and uh, I think just trouble with our own night vision because we were on a very bright bridge, and that was the only place we could get a flat view of it. So that's that's my current theory. Oh, there's a telescope question. Someone asked, "Why are there three tubes on the telescope?" That is a great question. So those three tubes are actually. Uh, uh, it's the telescope, it's a smaller telescope, and it's an even smaller telescope, is my favorite description. Uh, what it actually is, is it is the main telescope that you would use for scientific data, and it's two what are called finder scopes, which are used for, uh, basically, if you're, if you're trying to find an object in the night sky with some precision, but you are having trouble locating it, uh, you would first look in the smallest finder scope, and you would say, okay, I know that it's about in this area, and this is a very zoomed out telescope, so it has a wide field of view. And once you have it in that field of view, you'll say, okay, that's the star I want to look at. I'll then center it in a smaller secondary finding telescope. And once it's centered in there, you would look in the giant telescope and it would be hopefully in the field of view of that telescope. So it's sort of like on Google Maps when you zoom in on a destination slowly. Uh, those are your zoom levels that are available through this telescope. I think also what appears as uh, tubes are the the adjustment knobs and stuff too. The fine, like those look like tubes, but they're not tubes. That's true. There are, there are a few knobs that say that. The only purpose of them is to finally adjust the pointing of the telescope. Which, if you can see the one that I just adjusted. Can you uh, repeat that, Nico? There are a few tubes on there that, sorry, yeah, I walked away from the, from the camera. The only uh, purpose of some of the tubes on there is to be is to finally adjust the pointing of the telescope. So that was how astronomers could get that precision of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a degree. It was with those tiny sort of fine pointing knobs that you would turn. Uh, I think that wraps stuff up now. Yeah. yeah I think it does. All right. Well, thank you very much everyone for uh, coming out tonight, so to speak. Um, we had a, a really good time and hope that you did as well.
if we did not get to your question, feel free to, uh, you can email us or you can tune into another event. We always try to get to as many as possible and we try to wrap up as close to 9 p.m. as possible so people sort of have an idea of how long these events last. Uh, so I hope this was fun and satisfying for people and I hope that uh, you learned a little bit uh, or a lot about the entire history of the universe or about this telescope. All right, thank you for tuning in. Have a good night.